Howdy y'all. Something that's kind of inevitable in life and politics is that eventually, things get screwed up and result in suffering and even deaths that theoretically could have been prevented. Apart from myself, obviously, nobody is perfect. And likewise, there isn't really a system of government, or lack thereof for the anarchists in the crowd, that can completely eliminate preventable suffering. What we can do, however, is reduce it. And part of that process is examining past failures of our institutions, discovering what exactly is to blame in these scenarios, and then adjusting to avoid repeating the same mistake in the future. Now the first step to this is identifying what is to blame for institutional failures. And to help us get into the conservative mindset, we're going to take a look at how PragerU analyzes different economic failures. To start out, let's take a look at the Great Depression in the United States. Now, there were many factors behind the Great Depression as a whole. Banking panics, international trade, bunch of stuff, none of it good. But the incident that really got the ball rolling on the big sad was the stock market crash of 1929 where, following a decade of rampant speculation, the market faced a tiny bit of turmoil and bottomed out harder than an honors kid after getting their first C-. Now, how does an organization like PragerU, made up of staunch defenders of free market laissez-faire capitalism, approach the greatest failing of that system in the 20th century? Well, to start, they don't talk about it much. Across thousands of videos, I found about four that mention the Great Depression. By comparison, Venezuela, which, spoiler alert, is the other economic crash we're taking a look at today, has received about 10 videos. I wish I could give y'all an exact number, but the PragerU website's search bar is really bad. Half the results are completely unrelated to what I searched for. Like, forget fixing their politics, they need to fix their fucking website. <laughs> and when they do talk about it, they go to great lengths not to blame capitalism. Which was obviously what they were going to do. They are capitalist propagandists, after all. But I had assumed they would have simply blamed the presidents at the time. The presidents of the 1920s, while obviously not the sole cause of the Great Depression, did all play a role in bringing it about, whether through action or inaction. And by just blaming it all on a president, one could create an effective scapegoat while shielding from criticism of the system itself. For example, it's not capitalism's fault, it was just Herbert Hoover. But PragerU also doesn't do this, because they really love praising dead white guys and they really love these presidents in particular. They recently released a series of videos praising all of them. To start, there's Herbert Hoover, Success or Failure, where they shoot back at the popular notion that Herbert Hoover was a bad president by praising all of his many accomplishments from before he was president. Uh, yeah, great work guys. Really relevant information there. When talking about Hoover's role in the Great Depression, they say, He didn't cause it, and he made superhuman efforts to reverse it, but no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't stop it. If a single individual could have, it might have been this remarkable man. Okay, so they don't blame it on Hoover. And you know what? That's fair enough. There was a decade of unchecked speculation leading up to the Hoover presidency. He inherited the bull market. While he certainly did a really bad job at responding to the stock market crash, I'd agree he gets a bit too much of the blame in terms of actually causing the crash. Far more of that blame should fall upon his predecessor, Calvin Coolidge, who sat idly by for a term and a half while the stock market bubble steadily inflated to a bursting point. But see, the problem with this is that PragerU really likes Calvin Coolidge. Because as a president, Coolidge really didn't do all that much besides cut taxes on the wealthiest Americans and block any attempts at progress. 
as they put it, In the early 1920s, the progressive movement was on the march. Just as now, progressives always wanted to do something. Progressive plans included more aid for agriculture, encouraging unions, increasing taxes, and nationalizing important industries such as railroads and utilities. Coolidge blocked the progressives and thereby blocked their expansion of government. He vetoed farm subsidies twice, even though he personally came from farming country. Coolidge was sympathetic to farmers, but helping them wasn't the government's function. This lack of aid for farmers actually contributed somewhat to the Great Depression. During World War I, prices of agricultural goods shot up, so many farmers took out loans in order to buy more equipment so they could increase production. Following the end of the war, the prices came back down, and many farmers were left with loan payments on new equipment which now outweighed the revenue that equipment was brought in to generate. These farmers' inability to repay their loans are believed by many to have contributed to the banking panics of the Depression. In this video, PragerU only highlights like three specific things that Coolidge did as president. Did they really have to choose this to be one of them? You know, Calvin Coolidge was fairly ahead on race relations for the time. If you're insistent on making a video praising the guy, perhaps you could draw attention to his ultimately unsuccessful attempts at a federal lynching ban. But no, it's more important to prager you that he kept farmers poor. Aside aside, what do they say about Coolidge's role in the stock market crash and Great Depression? Some suggest that Coolidge was responsible for the stock market crash and the decade-long depression that followed after he left office. But that's a fallacy. The depression stretched so long not because of too little action from Calvin Coolidge, but because of too much action by his successors. Ah, I get it. How could Calvin Coolidge be at fault for the stock market crashing following a period of unregulated speculation if he didn't do anything during that period of unregulated speculation. Yeah, you notice how they completely just ignore the stock market crash there? Like, do they not have an actual rebuttal on that point? This lady is chairman of the Coolidge Foundation. You'd really think an organization dedicated to how great a specific dude is would have an actual response to one of his biggest criticisms. So what the heck actually caused the Great Depression? Well, in the Hoover video, they say, Yet just six months after Hoover's inauguration in the autumn of 1929, the stock market crashed. Slowly and inexorably, the United States followed the rest of the world into the Great Depression. However qualified he was for the presidency, Hoover was no match for the worst economic collapse in modern history, an international phenomenon rooted in the still unresolved upheavals of the First World War far beyond the capacities of any one leader to solve. Okay, so capitalism is not at all to blame, and the presidents are not at all to blame. It's just an international phenomenon rooted in the still unresolved upheavals of the First World War. PragerU has another video on World War I and how it, like, totally caused World War II and, like, the Cold War and, like, the Holocaust. And I just don't really care that much for this specific idea that major events in history stem wholly from other major events. Like, yes, World War I contributed directly to all of these events, including the Great Depression. But for all of these, there's a myriad other causes that get brushed over when you simplify it like this. The Great Depression was not an inevitable result of World War I. We've barely touched on it, and already we've identified several other factors. But that's the thing when it comes to economic crashes under capitalism. In the eyes of PragerU, these crashes have nothing to do with the actual economic system but are instead wholly the result of outside forces or even just coincidental. Crashes are always something that happens to capitalism. On the other hand, crashes are always something that happens because of socialism. And to help us demonstrate, we'll be looking at PragerU's take on Venezuela. 
Now, for the purpose of analyzing their argument, we're going to accept the framing that Venezuela is and was a socialist nation. But before we get into that, a brief explanation as to why this is not true. Now, the primary reason that Venezuela gets the socialist label is due to the rhetoric of Hugo Chavez, who described himself as a socialist, and the nationalization of the country's oil industry, which began in the 1970s and was completed during the Chavez presidency, along with several other smaller state-run companies. Now, is this socialism? No. Chavez may have dreamed of creating a socialist system, but just because you want a country to be socialist doesn't make it so. The actual economic system is the determining factor in whether or not a state is socialist, not the rhetoric of the nation's leader. There's a lot of talk about government control of industry, and while Venezuela had a large public sector compared to countries like the US, the majority of the economy was still private sector. Their main issue was just that their only major export was oil. Venezuela is more comparable to other petrostates like the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia than any model of a socialist society. And this was something that the right recognized before the crisis got them to collectively go with the socialism ruined Venezuela line. Which brings us to the third reason Venezuela is considered socialist, which is because it is undergoing an economic crisis. If we take a look at PragerU's video, How's Socialism Doing in Venezuela? We find relatively little in terms of actual discussion of policy or the cause of the crash. Instead, we are treated to a description of the aesthetics of Hugo Chavez and a series of false truisms. Socialism is a drug, and like a drug, it feels great at first, but eventually it will ruin your country. Socialism always works in the beginning, so people are fooled in the beginning. It's easy for governments to confiscate money, but eventually there's no more money to confiscate. Once a country goes down a socialist path, there's no easy way back. And the longer a country stays socialist, the harder it is to reform it. These are not serious political arguments examining the role the socialist policies of Chavez and Maduro had in the Venezuelan financial crisis. They are affirmations for an audience that already agrees that socialism is the cause of economic failure. It is irrelevant whether or not the nation was actually socialist. Much of the opposition conservatives hold towards socialism is based upon these types of affirmations. They are mantras that conservatives recite over and over to help convince themselves and others. And these mantras do not simply apply to their view that socialism fails economically. If you air any grievance with capitalism near a conservative, you are almost certain to hear the phrase, communism killed 100 million people. Communists killed 70 million people in China, more than 20 million people in the Soviet Union, not including about 5 million Ukrainians, and almost one out of every three Cambodians. And while authoritarian governments that call themselves communist or socialist did kill people in the USSR, China, and elsewhere, this mantra brushes over quite a lot. These numbers come from a collection of essays called The Black Book of Communism. You can tell that's where the numbers are from, because PragerU lists the book eight times in the sources for this video. The Black Book has been criticized for an array of reasons, such as its softness on Nazism, it includes both Nazis and Nazi collaborators among the victims of communism, and makes the argument that communism is just as bad if not worse than Nazism, which is also the argument of this PragerU video. This false equivalency they draw is made even more dishonest when you consider the role that the Soviet Union played in defeating Nazism in World War II. Those efforts have been rewarded with a couple million added to the Victims of Communism tally. The book has also been criticized by many, including some of its contributors, for inflating the numbers. Contributors Jean-Louis Margolin and Nicholas Wirth have said that the book's editor was obsessed with reaching a total of 100 million. 
To reach that number, the book includes any unnatural death that occurred in these nations, without regards as to whether communist policy actually played a role in it. Such as the famine in China, which accounts for most of the tens of millions of deaths attributed to Chinese communism. China was no stranger to famines prior to the rise of the CCP, having undergone an estimated 1,828 in the 2,000 years prior, and following the industrialization of the Great Leap Forward, there have been no famines in China. How does this effective curbing of famines factor into the Black Book's assessment? It doesn't. Additionally, across all of the Black Book's calculations, no consideration is given for other factors, such as drought, war, or sanctions. The primary cause of every death is just communism. And it's not like there aren't deaths caused by these governments. The Soviet government, for example, executed 800,000 people under the rule of Joseph Stalin. I'd argue it's pretty obvious that the problem here is authoritarianism, not socialism. You know, it's not like Marx wrote anything about to have a true socialist state, one must meet this quota of executions. Although he probably would have said it more like German-like. But the conservative view has no capacity for nuance. These deaths and all the others are socialism killing people, because socialism kills people. Capitalism, however, doesn't kill people, because conservatives like capitalism. Unnatural deaths under a socialist government are people dying from socialism. Unnatural deaths under a capitalist government are purely coincidental. While deaths from famine in China and the Soviet Union are held up as worse than Nazism, the famines in India while it was under British rule, which killed 35 million people, are, by comparison, rarely invoked as a criticism of capitalism, even when the famines were directly exacerbated by the British, such as when Winston Churchill denied food and medical aid to starving Indians under the justification that famine or no famine, Indians will breed like rabbits. Today, 9 million people around the world die every year from malnutrition and diseases associated with malnutrition, and this number includes 3 million children. In the US, tens of thousands die every year due to a lack of healthcare coverage, and if we wanted to stretch a little, like the editor of the Black Book did, the Native American genocide, spurred by the United States' bootstrapping Destiny manifesting, capitalist dreams accounted for the deaths of more than a hundred million indigenous people by many estimates. Coincidentally, PragerU also denies this genocide. As for the charge of genocide, there was no genocide. So just going by the standards that PragerU has set, the amount of deaths attributable to capitalism far exceeds that of their number for communism. Although I would like to take the opportunity to say that, while I think it's apparent capitalist greed and apathy has contributed to the preventable deaths of tens to hundreds of millions, Nazism is still much worse. Unlike some people, I have no interest in rehabilitating fascism. But the way PragerU and other conservatives see it, capitalism cannot be blamed for any of these deaths. Deaths within a capitalist system are purely incidental, even when that system could have prevented those deaths and failed to, even when that system contributes directly to those deaths. Those deaths are not the fault of the system. The system is blameless. Deaths within a socialist system are indicative of the inherent evil of socialism, even when the actual economic system had nothing to do with said deaths. To an outside observer, this is a clear double standard, the most blatant of hypocrisy. But to the conservative, it's not, because their goal is not a fair analysis of the pros and cons of various economic systems, but rather the maintaining of their preferred system, capitalism. To paraphrase PragerU, it's not capitalism that has to prove itself, it's everything else. But capitalism has proven itself. It's proven itself to be a deeply flawed system. 
Over and over again, conservatives will try to implement the same policies that we know don't fucking work. We know unregulated capitalism fails. We know Reaganomics fails. But we keep trying them, and we keep facing the consequences. Meanwhile, any attempt at something else gets immediately shot down on the basis that it's too socialist. And we can't do anything too socialist because socialism never works. And we know that socialism never works because the capitalist class keeps telling us that it doesn't. Our goal as a society should be to make things better. We cannot become so terrified of the socialist boogeyman conservatives have constructed that we become blind to the failures of our capitalist reality. Thanks for watching. Like, comment, and subscribe. Follow me on Twitter, where I post more than once a month, and a huge thanks to my patrons, who should be on screen right now. They give me money. Do you want to give me money? There's a button in the description for that. I had planned on not covering PragerU for a while longer after making a feature-length movie on them, but then I was having writer's block with another project, which should be coming out in a couple weeks. And then the Calvin Coolidge video came out, and I just couldn't resist. I'll be heading back to school in a couple weeks too, so don't worry, I'll still upload about as much probably. But the videos are gonna look different, cause, you know, I don't have a place to film.